and welcome. Welcome to everyone from around the world to the Institute of Coaching webinar on real-time leadership, finding your winning moves when the stakes are high. I want to welcome everyone from wherever you are in the world. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Say hello in the chat box. We love to hear where everyone is coming from. We always have a wonderful global audience of coaches. And it's particularly special day for me as I get to introduce my dear colleagues and friends, Carol Kaufman and David Noble, who have completed and today published and launched their amazing new book, as I said, called Real Time Leadership. And we are honored to have them with us on launch day. <laughs> so I know that many of you are familiar with David and Carol and they are longtime thought leaders, founder and friends of the Institute of Coaching. But for those of you who are not familiar with them by any chance, let me just take a quick minute to give you their backgrounds and then we will turn it over to them. So as many of you know, Carol Kaufman is the founder of the Institute of Coaching with Margaret Moore and Susan David and someone I've been privileged to work with and know for many, many years. So I'm super excited to see her here with this new book. She's also an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School, a visiting professor at Henley Business School, and a senior leadership advisor at Egon Zender. She's known globally as one of the top leaders in the field of coaching and has been shortlisted as one of the top eight coaches in the world by Thinkers 50. Her book, Real-time leadership, finding your winning moves when the stakes are high, as I just said, is coming out today from Harvard Business Press, and we are super excited to have Carol with us. Her co-author is also a major thought leader with the Institute of Coaching. David Noble is an executive coach for many years, a leadership advisor, a strategist who works with CEOs and their teams, and generally works at the top of the house with board of directors and C-suite executives. He also works with investors and star athletes to help them identify, clarify, and resolve their most important leadership issues. He founded his own boutique firm called View Advisors in 2009 and is also engaged as a senior advisor to several global professional service firms, also Egon Zender and Oliver Wyman Group. He's also been named by Thinkers 50 as one of the world's top coaches. So we are privileged to have two of the best of the best here with us today. And I am super excited to hear more as I know you are about their new book. And I just wanna caution you that we are gonna all be super attentive and excited to hear what, what they're going to share, but please do me a favor so that I don't get overwhelmed with the chat box and the Q and A box. So if you have questions, we will try to get to as many as we can. But if you could put them in the Q&A box, then it helps me from you know, losing my train of thought. And I'm going to help them so that they can stay focused. So with that, welcome, Carol and David. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you for all visiting. We're very, very excited. So today is the day our book launches. So uh, please consider buying it on Amazon.com, especially today. Uh, hardback if you're in the U.S. Why David and I wrote the book? Um, well, we wrote the book for many people, but we also wrote it for you. The book is many things, but it's also nearly a leadership coaching manual because we'll describe sort of the tips of the icebergs, but for any kind of slide that we show or group, there's three or four chapters underneath it. So we're doing tips of icebergs to get you oriented. We wrote the book when we were just trying to figure out what were we thinking? Because when we were working together, we could see that some things really landed and our clients were really thriving. So we're sharing those with you, sort of secrets, but it's very useful for aspiring leaders as well as, as we'll talk about you for your personal development as well as your professional development. So um, another reason why I wanted to write the book was I can remember back in my very first job, which was quite some time ago, and I was writing a speech for the CEO, and I used the words renouncing unprecedented volatility and uncertainty in the world. <laughs> you can see that things haven't changed uh, since then, and I'm really sick of that term. And what I wanted to do was work with Carol 
so that we could write a book so that leaders and their coaches can step confidently into these crazy circumstances, whether they're new types of crises or maybe even the biggest opportunity of your career that you're facing. So what we're gonna do today is just give a brief introduction to um, what we're calling real-time leadership. So we're gonna talk about the model that underpins the book and do a double click on a couple of key elements of the model. And then we're gonna have lots of time for questions. Um, and just as we step into this, what is one of the things that is differentiating about the book is that it's evidence-based and very, very practical. So it's actually a playbook that you can come back to over and over again in your leadership. And we draw on a very broad ranging set of framework from psychology, strength-based psychology, strength-based positive psychology in particular, neuroscience, intentional change theory, but also things like corporate strategy, military strategy, and risk theory as well. So it's just an interesting combination of analytical components as well as behavioral. Thank you. So um, one thing we're very excited about is some of the wonderful people who have endorsed us. So two of our favorites at the Institute are Amy Edmondson from Psychological Safety and Dan Goleman. Dan Goleman said we were a savvy playbook. Um, and Amy was, we are wise and practical book. And a number of people have really shared their kind of excitement and wisdom with us. We see Marshall, Amy, and Dan, and Byron, a football player. So we have um, people who have loved it are uh, CEOs, investors, artists, many leadership coaches, thought leaders. And um, what we're very delighted about, and we hope you take their advice, is Inc. Magazine named us as one of the four top books to buy, business books to buy in 2023. 20, uh, so. Um, do take their advice. And why don't we now, we'll just sort of walk you through the overview and the model. Sure, so when we think about real-time leadership, we think about change happening in the now. It doesn't happen in the past, it doesn't happen in the future. And for us, real-time leadership is about making the most of every moment that you've got. And that's whether or not you're making a split-second decision, whether you're working on your top priority for this fiscal quarter, or whether you're pursuing a lifetime goal. Uh, and we find that most good leaders that we've worked with try to make the most of every moment by really relying on their many years of deep pattern recognition and experience as leaders. So when they see A happen, and then when they see B happen, they kind of instinctively know that C is the right thing to do. Uh, now that's okay in terms of day-to-day -day operating environments, but we haven't had a day-to-day -day operating environment for quite some time. Uh, beyond that, it's also true that if you're relying on your reflexes, those instincts, you're not getting any better as a leader, even in those day-to-day -day situations. But in particular, it may not work to rely on your reflexes when you're facing something novel, whether that's a new type of crisis or whether it's a new type of opportunity, say it's a 10x opportunity that you've never seen that kind of scale and scope before, how do you really step into that? So basically using your reflexes in those circumstances could take you in exactly the wrong direction. So what we wanna do is learn when and how to transcend your reflexes and lead in a new way. So how do you actually make the most of every moment? So the way you make most of every moment is creating space. David talked about overcoming your reflexes and your default patterns, because many of us are very successful. Many of our people are very successful but we have to move on to the, to the future. And one of the backbone quotes from um, the wisdom of the world is by Viktor Frankl. And you probably know this where it says, between every stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our freedom. And our entire book is about not only how to make that space, but then what do you do? in that space. And that's what our acronym for M-O-V-E is, to lead you towards peak performance in that space that you can create. So walk, we'll walk you through it. Um, M is for us to be mindfully alert. We'll speak to that in a moment. O is to be an options generator. V is to validate your vantage point. And E is to engage and affect change. 
so that when you're in one of those moments, you can make space by each of these in sort of more and more space. Now, what we find first though, if we kind of like go back and we'll share something with you that we call the five C's. So if we wanna be at our best and we wanna overcome our reflexes and like, what is it we wanna do just to start you know, making that space? So now, as I talk about this, imagine that you're about to have like a really difficult conversation tomorrow or a big life-changing interview. Um, or you know any sudden opportunity and, and you're activated, what can you do? What we want to help you do, and this is based on the work of Richard Schwartz, who wrote the Internal Family Systems Model, which is lovely, and we're doing a part of this. So we're going with that five C's, is how can I be calm? How can I be clear, curious, compassionate, and courageous? So when I am facing one of these challenges, which of these are easy, which of these are hard, and these accelerate your capacity to do any of the move model we talk about later, but also just help you orient. And um, David has come up with a great exercise based on this. So what we wanted to do is turn this into a very practical tool. And as we all know, just even the power of naming how we're feeling can actually help you settle. So this is an exercise designed to do that. So I'd just invite everyone here just to do a personal reflection right now. And on a scale of one to 10, just ask yourself how calm you are right now. 10 is super calm. One is extremely anxious and activated. Um, doesn't matter what the number is. It just needs to be a genuine reflection of, of how you're feeling right now. Second is um, how clear is your thinking? 10 is a super clear, crystal clear thinking. One is pretty fuzzy. Um, ben, how curious are you? 10 would be, I'm really interested in all kinds of new ideas, new concepts, meeting new people, learning about them, learning about myself. Uh, one is I'm pretty disinterested, pretty disengaged. Uh, then ask yourself on a scale of one to 10, how compassionate you are. And you can ask that in two parts. So the first part is just how compassionate are you towards yourself and then towards others? We often have different um, points of view on that aspect of compassion. And then finally, ask yourself, how courageous are you right now? Are you at a 10 out of 10 and ready to face down anything? Or are you more at a one and actually I'd like to run away <laughs> really fast? So wherever you're at on that, that will just, the power of naming that will help you settle. I'll give you a live example of how something like this can create massive impact and be a game changer with an actual client situation. So many of you will appreciate um, um, how difficult an industry private equity is. So I was working with an operating partner in a private equity fund who is also the C chief executive officer of a portfolio company. And we had about 15 minutes in our first meeting before he was inviting me in to um, sit in on an Exco meeting. So uh, I started out with them and I said, okay, let's just talk about um, how you're feeling right now. So how calm are you, scale one to 10? He said, 10, I'm always calm. But okay, so how clear is your thinking right now? 10, it's always clear. I'm always incredibly clear. Third is how curious are you? He's 10, I'm an incredibly curious person. Fourth, I said, you know, we're gonna skip the courageous part because I think I know that. Um, fifth, I asked, how compassionate are you? right now on a scale of one to 10. And then there was a silence that stretched 10 seconds, which felt like forever. And he basically said, I'm really low on that. And so my response was, okay, that's fine. Understand where you're at on that. And can you think of a time, can you visualize a moment when you were a 10 out of 10? And he said, yeah, I'm thinking about my son who's a champion uh, tennis player. So great, let's go into the meeting. So in that meeting, the CFO was uh, announcing that he was leaving the company for personal reasons because his father was in the last stages of life and he wanted to care with him, take care of him through to the end. And in the middle of that conversation or that announcement, um, the CFO broke down and started to weep uncontrollably. And, and again, there was a silence. Uh, this time it was about five seconds, which was long enough. And the CEO got up out of his chair 
went around the table, sat next to the CFO, put his arms around him and said, we've got you. And that was a fundamental game changer in that CEO's leadership. And as we were leaving the room, he said, I never would have done that had we not done that little exercise. So what Carol and I look for constantly throughout the book are these opportunities to have very small changes that create disproportionately positive impact on leadership. So that's an example of that. Mm -hmm. And again, in the background, in the book, we don't talk a lot about the science, but it's all very science-based. So the whole thing about naming, uh, creating space, there's a lot of research on that. Um, Lisa Barrett on uh, how emotions are made, lots and lots of research. And again, David's sort of saying, so, you know, look at your son. When have you been able to do this? This is also based on positive psychology and intentional change theory. So we don't spell all of that out, but pretty much everything we're doing has an evidence base to it. And that's in the notes section at the end of each chapter. So what we're going to do now is we're going to just walk you through this move model and we're going to do a double click. We're going to do a quick double click on the M and the O because we're going to go into that in detail and a slightly longer click on V and E. So how to be mindfully alert, the options generator, validate your vantage point and affect and engage change. So let's, um, we'll begin. So David, so you want to take us into this? Yeah. So mindfully alert um, means what? To what? So for us, it's about the three dimensions of leadership. So we all know leaders who are one or two dimensional. So when you think about the individual that is very results oriented and always hits the targets, but rolls over people while doing that in the process, or we know the amazing servant leader who really cares about people, but finds it hard to hold them accountable, or even the individual contributor or subject matter expert who actually finds it hard to relate to other humans. So those are all one or two dimensional leaders at most. And we feel that you literally have to be a whole human. And to do that, that means understanding your external dimension, which is what do you need to get done? The inner dimension, which is who do you wanna be as a person, as a leader while you're doing this in terms of your character strengths and your values. And then third is how do you best need to relate to others to unlock their potential and achieve goals together? So that's the interpersonal dimension. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through a little bit of the um, options generator. And we're going to talk more about the second and third uh, dimensions of change in a bit. So here, um, we're talking about the, the research of Rick Snyder and Shane Lopez and a number on the options generator, which is, you know, how can you have four different ways in to relate to people? So we have this fight, flight, freeze, and befriend is our main uh, default ways of, of kind of responding to, to a challenge. And we've translated these into for anything you do, do you lean in and go to action bias, lean back, go to thought, data bias, lean with people first, or don't lean at all, which is the ability to not be triggered um, at all. And we're going to double click on the options generator in, in a, a little bit. It's very powerful. And um, Harvard Business Review in the January, February issue published an article called The Power of Options, which can be helpful. Um, okay, now this one we're not going to talk about more later. And again, if you want any more of this, you know, um, we can try and give you some extra time another day. So, vantage point. Um, you know, 75% of business failures are due to overconfidence. And then other kinds of failures are due to underconfidence, but also not seeing clearly. So if we think of intentional change theory as if, again, if I was a 10 out of 10, what would I look like? What would an absolute 10 out of 10 vantage point look like? Well, the first thing is that you would be clear. Um, you know, are you nearsighted, farsighted? You know, do you see things like, you know, strategy or tactical? What, what do you tend to do? And can you step into the opposite? The other one is, are you wearing rose colored glasses um, or dark colored glasses? So what's important is for you just to know what it is you tend to do and be able to course correct. 
Another one, if I have a clear vantage point, but also like how clear do I need to be? You know, some things really need that high definition, high detail, the, you know, the view of an eagle. But if you do that for everything, A, you'll be exhausted, B, you know, there goes your priorities and um, you'll just be worn out. So you have to use your judgment. Where do I need that high depth? And where will a grainy picture do? So that's the resolution. Then we've got breadth and depth. For this particular challenge, do I need to be narrow it in or do I need to really be looking at the horizon? Do I need to be close up or can I be way up? You know, do I need to be a hawk or a hummingbird? And how to kind of be aware of what kind of challenges do this. We have like chapters on each one. Then the really important one is what is interfering with your vision? What distorts it? And this could be your personality that you tend to sort of see things in, in a way automatically or quickly. But of course, there's the power of unconscious bias and blind spots. So this is sort of a, a picture of validating your vantage point and not minimizing different opportunities or threats, not being overwhelmed by them. So that's the V for the vantage point. And now we'll take you through um, a little bit on E. So E is about engaging and affecting change at scale as a leader, whether you're an individual contributor or whether you've got a very large organization that you're leading. And this is where M, O, and V all get scaled up in a big way. So if you think of M generally as what you need to get done or your goals, uh, O is the how, the options generator is the how, how to do those, and V is your reality test. Then E is really about sending leadership signals. So it's most important to make sure that leadership signals sent for the ones received. Um, so there's some ways to test for that. And then to iterate those signals as you move along and learn new things and experience new things and your teams and organizations give feedback to you. And this is actually a really interesting um, combination of both military theory where we adapted a concept which is used in the military called commander's intent to decentralize a mission so that people at the edge of the organization can still act in accordance with what the leader's intent would be, even if the leader is not on the ground or there with them. And it's also a combination of design thinking, which is about forming a prototype of what your leadership would look like, putting a stake in the ground, if you will, and then moving forward and iterating on that version with new versions as you learn more and experience more. Mm -hmm. And each one of these, as you can imagine, is a chapter, and we have many sort of exercises and tips along the way. So now we will, if my computer will let me, and my computer is not letting me, hold on. Now we're going to double click and help you um, look at M, being mindfully alert. And David, I have to sort out why my computer isn't... Um, moving us along. There we go. Yeah. Okay. So let's just move one more slide, Carol, please. Mm -hmm. So when we referred earlier to the three dimensions of leadership, the first dimension is literally, what do I need or want to get done? What are my goals? And that's often easier said than done. So for example, I might think that my goal is to go into an executive committee and get approval for a large capital expenditure. That's my win. And then if I really step back and think about it, is that the most important thing? Is that the right thing to do right now? Maybe it's just to have a greater discussion around the table and make sure everyone has a voice, feels better about the decision, and that will actually help me fine tune my recommendation to get approval on the next meeting. So it's not always obvious that we're crystal clear on our goals. So what we want to do is just give you a basic tool to talk about what is the most important thing that's on your plate. And you pick, figure out the time frame. It might be today, it might be this year, it might be a lifetime. And if you can basically specify the who, what, where, when, and why of that, that's going to flesh out that goal. So again, the more powerfully you can name a goal, the more likely you are to reach it. So that's basically the first dimension. So I invite you just to think about something that you're working on in your own work right now uh, or with your clients right now. And just ask yourself, what is the most important thing right now? And try and flesh that out a little bit. 
second dimension is really to answer the question, who do I need to be? The second dimension of change. And, you know, and for our leaders, a lot of them know what they need to do, but have they really checked in with who do they need to be? And that can be, you know, how do you walk your talk? How do you um, become aware of your inner values, your purpose and what matters to you and how you can pull on that, especially when suddenly you're in the midst of a tornado of fire and sharks as one of our people described his life? And in what parts of you do you wanna cultivate? So we came up with the question, who do I wanna be right now as part of a new year's resolution instead of a do to ask that. And Marshall Goldsmith has picked this up and calls it the Carol Kaufman question and believes it's like the best thing on Buddhism, which um, I'm, I'm happy about. But try that. Um, would like you to do, like each one of you for real, today, tomorrow, ask yourself this question 20 times, 30 times, and see how does it do this split second course correction? Because as David said, we're really talking about micro behaviors. Uh, for us and our leaders, how do you change in no extra time? And this is an example. So that's the second dimension of change. Now, the third dimension of change is really, you know, this is what I want to do. This is who I need to be. Well, how do I need to relate to people? What is the optimal way? And by the way, we've got like two chapters on this in the book. But what, what do you do so that you can really connect with people? And one of the things as we talk about is going from the golden rule, treat others as you would like to be treated, to the platinum rule, treat others as they would like to be treated. So you can imagine an extrovert boss and an introvert report and what that might be. The introvert is having issues, the extrovert goes, oh yes, this person needs help in a pep talk. Now imagine the reverse. That extrovert needs to think, oh, this person needs space to think, how can I adjust my style so that I can then have kind of the impact uh, that I need and able to shift. So now what we're going to do is just sort of walk you through a couple of stories to make this real for yourself. Then we will open up for some questions about the M. So if you have some, you can start jotting them down and, and Jeff will um, let us know what some of the top questions are. So this is like 3D leadership in real time. And I'm just going to go to an example like in my own house when my son was only 11. And um, I walked into the dining room and there was this squalid mess on the table. And he looked at me and said, I'm done with my homework. Can I go watch TV? All right. So you, automatically, what do you want to do? You want to finish the homework assignment. You say, no, this is not done. It's a mess, et cetera. But wait, if you just say, wait, what do I need to get done here? Is it just getting this homework done and going into default? Or do I need to pause? and say, well, wait, maybe the bigger thing here is to help with discipline, or maybe the bigger thing here is to help him have a love of learning, or maybe the bigger thing here is for him to see me be able to regulate myself when there's something like this, and for me to be a role model, which takes us into who do I wanna be? Ideally, I'd like to be a role model in a question at time like that. And I would like to have invested enough time in my own growth so that I'm able to manage my emotions at that time. And then how do I need to relate? What, what does you know, Michael need me to do? You know, if I was in that situation, maybe I'd need nurturance, but maybe he needs caring. You know, instead of caring, he needs just like, hey, Michael, come on, or to step back and give him space to think. So for this, you know, even if it's something as obvious, it could be a team meeting, whatever, but to stop, ask yourself those three questions. Um, David, do you want to give your more business example? Yep. So I'll, I'll just um, touch briefly on an actual case study and just give a little bit of background. So one of the big reasons that Carol and I wrote this book was that we stumbled into something called two-on-one coaching. Uh, so I was a strategist for a long period of time. And when I was in that role, I would never think of meeting with a CEO just by myself and saying that I could handle all the issues that were facing um, that person in the organization. So I'd have a fleet of people with me. Now that doesn't work in coaching because the relationship matters obviously, as well as the content. But what Carol and I found is that we're so complementary to each other in terms of experience, insights, and personalities that working two-on-one -on -one in some of the most complex situations actually drives up the quality of the coaching quite a bit. So in this particular case study, uh, Noel, one of our leaders, was facing a major catastrophe, and she literally had hours left to act. Um, the FDA had suddenly recalled one of her major products, 
And when we talked her through it, her immediate instinct, her reflex was to fight and attack the announcement. But shortly after just unpacking that a little bit with her, she was quickly able to name that this was her reflex and see it would only make things worse. So instead, what she did was step into 3D leadership. And the way she did it was to be very clear that what she needed to do right now was to make sure that the product recall was done as effectively and smoothly as possible and protect consumers. So she also knew that she needed to publicly accept accountability on behalf of the organization while committing to a plan to fix the quality issue. So that was both a communication plan and a decision matrix that we created with her. Second, we really wanted to talk to her about the human dimension of who she wanted to be or who she needed to be at that point in time. And frankly, this was all about courage, about stepping into courage and also to be able to walk the talk about showing her caring and support to customers, to employees, and all stakeholders. So we worked on with her on how to really step into that and occupy that, even in the middle of a very stressful crisis. And then the final aspect, and I'll draw on Carol's four stances here, was we talked to her about how she could best relate to others in the moment. So first thing she did was to lean in and activate the organization's crisis mitigation plan. Fortunately, they had one of those. Um, right hard on the heels of that, she leaned back and quickly gathered more data on possible remedies to the product um, default. Then she leaned with employees in the organization to let them know that she had their back through all of this and that they needed to come through this together. And then she took a moment to not lean so that she wouldn't panic in the middle of all this. So she really stepped into three-dimensional leadership and there's a whole other case on how she did that. But um, suffice to say that that organization is still at the um, top of the house in terms of its brand and she's still at the top of the game and in her role. Hmm. So Jeff, um, what we'd love it right now, if um, you could do some questions, maybe for about five minutes, then we're going to go quickly go through the options generator, but give an example of a coaching scenario and how it can help you as the coach when you're coaching as, as well. So do you have a question for us that surfaces? Um, well, let's encourage everyone to put your questions in the Q&A box and um, we'll see what comes in. And we um, I. We can answer more question. questions later too uh, on the on LinkedIn within the institute. Yeah, so feel free to put the questions in the box here. Um, in my privileged position of being the moderator, I will have a, a question that I have. <laughs> <laughs> Take um, over, Jeff. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just have a situation that comes up quite often, and I'd love to hear how you two would potentially approach it as executive coaches using your mindfully alert frame. And that is when you have a C-suite leader who's struggling with a CEO, so it's managing upward, right? You know, CFO or senior marketing, but they're looking up at the CEO and they find it difficult to communicate with the CEO because the CEO tends to be laconic and very oriented toward goals, results, very short and sweet and get to the point. So if you're looking upwards at this CEO and you want to be able to share with him or her really what's going on for you, how could this model be helpful? Hey, David, do you want to start or want me to start? Go ahead. All right. Well, the first thing, what I think of is here I am. Okay. And here's my CEO. First of all, um, how do I have enough motion regulation so that I can make a space to choose how to react? And in that, in that moment, how can I be clear? In this conversation, what is it that I want to accomplish? It may be I want him to change his mind about something. It may be I want him to be more open to what I have to say. You know, it may be how can I help him be, feel safe enough to hear what I have to say? And then there's like inside of me, what story am I telling myself on him being laconic and um, and sort of like just sort of let's let's just go and get goals oriented. But it's also possible to do a little bit of education to say, hey, it's so great that you're clear on what we need to do. My guess is we might be able to get there even better if we concentrated on some other things as well. Mm -hmm. uh, David? 
Yeah, I think it's asking those three questions, but maybe in a different order. So normally we talk about the external goals, then the internal goals and the interpersonal. So I would say you'd still start with the external about what do I want to achieve with the interaction? And, and that could be any number of things. It could also include just, I want to build the relationship with the CEO, but more likely you need to engage the CEO on some kind of important interaction for a decision or an action to be taken. So I think understanding that first, because then that sets the parameters for um, the interpersonal dimension, how you need to relate. And so the way um, Carol and I think about this is um, it's about how are you able to express yourself in a way that the other person can receive. So if that CEO is very goal oriented, how can I frame things in terms of being goal oriented and also furthering the interest of the CEO so that we're all aligned on that? Um, so I would do that. And then I would also probably ask myself um, internally, um, who do I need to be in this moment? So if I'm a person that's activated uh, by the CEO, how can I step into greater calm so that I can engage more effectively? Mm -hmm. Or if I'm someone who's actually quite conceptual, but not necessarily numeric, and if the CEO is highly numeric, how can I get some help to kind of frame things and step into a more analytical uh, mindset as well so that I can relate more effectively. That's great. Thank you, David. Yeah, I think I think what you're doing is you're conflating and bringing um, alignment between who do I want to be and how do I want to relate? Like you're putting the two things mm -hmm. together, which is really powerful. That's so we actually, have a question coming in from Valerie that I think you guys would love to address. I think I'm pronouncing it right, but it's it looks like Valerie. How do you convince a hyper-rational leader of the importance of this mindfulness, mindful alertness, and concern with things like how do you want to be or how do you engage compassionately with staff? Oh, I'll I'll start that one because I'm <laughs> into mindfulness in, in, a, in a great deal. So um, how do you um, convince someone? So one of our biggest collaborators on this book was uh, is a retired four-star general named Chuck Jacoby. And he's um, had battlefield postings and his last position was head of Northern Command. So he would have been the person giving the order to the F-22 to shoot the Chinese balloon out of the sky. And in his experience, when he was talking about, he said, I've worked with the toughest leaders on the planet. I've worked with the toughest people. I've been up against the toughest people. And one of the things that matters most in the end is kindness and generosity. So it's just interesting mm. that um, someone who the warrior um, would actually say that. So Carol and I kind of frame these things in terms of um, words and images that would um, resonate with a leader who's more hard edged. So instead of talking about kindness and generosity, you talk about people having their back, for example. Mm -hmm. So part of it's in the language that you can use. That's great. And, and I know, think so also- uh, Oh, go on. Go ahead, David. Just, yeah, just, just one more thing that related back to what you said Jeff, about combining the internal and the interpersonal. So when you think about um, someone who's leaning in, which is probably that type of leader, there's so many different ways to lean in based on who you can be or want to be. So, you know, you can lean in like you're driving a tank, or you can lean in with the grace of a dancer, or you can lean in with compassion, and you can lean in with humor, and you can lean in with generosity. So there's so many ways when you think about the options that you can step into your leadership that are characterized, you're still leaning in, but you're leaning in in so many different ways, you're much more agile. Which um, on two things, it leads us to our next session. But the other thing is, you know, in both examples, what we were also looking at is if the, um, you know, many of our leaders also, like the first dimension is it, but how do you then sometimes match their extrinsic motivation with these other factors? Like how might you be able to get this done better if you were in tune with your people? Or is it gonna be expensive for you to not address the need for your people or your need to manage your own um, regulation? So that's one, so match it with the extrinsic motivation, but also their language. So if you've got someone that's hyper-rational, there's a lot of data that you could share with them to talk about increasing your psychological safety, your capacity to relate, and performance outcomes. So um, go extrinsic and then go to um, their language. 
But what I'd like to do now in this service of time is David, maybe you could do something quickly on the options generator. Sure. I'll then zip through kind of quickly and we can get to the story of um, Max and give an example of how to use this in the coaching. So we just talked about um, the three dimensions of leadership and that's really goal setting. So that's what you wanna be across those three dimensions and the options generator is about how do you get there? And so when you think about or when we think about all the great leaders that we've worked with, they all have some kind of path towards uh, a win in each of those three dimensions. So they know what they wanna get done and how to get there. They know who they wanna be and have some sense of how to step into that. And they know that they need to be agile and relating to others. So um, that's all fine. But these days, the world is so incredibly nonlinear that we get things thrown at us all the time. So obstacles and curveballs. So it's no longer enough to have one way to win. Um, you have to have a backup for that and you have to have a backup for your backup. So what we've created is the ability to step into four ways to win across each of those three dimensions. And what we're illustrating here on this particular slide is the interpersonal dimension. There are other ways to create options for the inner dimension as well as the external dimension, but this is interpersonally. So basically, as Carol said, it's leaning in, it's having a point of view, it's having conviction about something, it's giving guidance, making decisions. Leaning back is about getting input from others, gathering data, questioning your facts. Leaning with is connecting with people, encouraging them, supporting them. And not leaning is that moment, which is the toughest, as Carol alluded to, which is just taking a moment to um, pause and reflect, to either um, deactivate yourself or to see what arises because often our subconscious will tell us things that we don't know that we know. Absolutely. So you can check out these slides a little bit more later, but David just kind of summed these up, you know, roll up your sleeves, you know, um, and with your internal world, how to step into who you want to be, be active in your learning and lean back is, you know, what kind of questions, sort of a more contemplative view. And then, um, we're going to look there at, at this one, lean with, which is people first, you know, so if you've got, um, you know, what needs to be done, you think about what do the people need first to collaborate, align, um, who I want to be, you're going to go from your caring, how to help others, how to choose how to relate is to focus on what makes others feel safe. But as we talk about in the book for all of these, number one, there's different ways to do them. And there's also times to not do them. And we sort of go through a decision tree on when you do this and when you do not do this. Um, and, um, and again, don't lean is again, the big one. Um, and that's where you wanna kind of create the shower experience or the running experience where you can be quiet enough so that something comes to you. But now I'd love to talk to you about the story of um, me and Max. And it's the case of the horrible boss and notice the question mark there. Carol, wait, wait, wait. Please tell the story about the sneer first because I think that's really good in the context oh, yeah, like of the, the four stances. One? Yeah. Okay, in the this, in this spirit of time. Okay, so here's um, an example. So, okay, say, um, so David, I'm gonna pick on you. I'm giving a talk okay. and I'm doing my team and David, I noticed that David sneers at me. So David, do a sneer. I, can, I can't even do that. I'm gonna try it. <laughs> okay. And so- My the face doesn't one. work that way. You're too lovely. Um, okay, <laughs> so you're there and you're giving a sneer. So if it's lean in, I'd say, hey, David, like what's going on here? I, I see you're not happy. Okay. Now, if I was gonna lean back, I might think, you know, okay, in the context now, David has typically, you know, this is unusual behavior for him. I don't necessarily need to zone in on it. Like what's what's the overall data? Now, if I'm gonna lean with, I might go, oh no, what did I do? Like, you know, I'm making David uncomfortable and how can I make him more comfortable? And then to not lean at all is there I am. Here's something that could really trigger me and I'm choosing and able to not be triggered. And remember that will pull on that I've done my second dimension of leadership, homework of managing, my um, inner state, and then being able to choose for those four things, um, what is the, what's, what's best for this person in this moment? 
And it all comes down to, again, if I've done my five C's, I'm more able to cho do choice. So it's choice and choice and more choice. Thanks, David. Now I'll tell you the story of me and Max. And this is one of the first times I was using this model. I may even come up with it then. I, I can no longer remember. But this one, um, this is a coaching story. And okay, so I was working with Max. Max is the CEO, I mean, the COO of a, of a big media company. And his former best friend is now the COO, CEO. And they've been friends for a long time until she just started molting over time. Now that she had the power, she was micromanaging. She was like structuring everything for him, being very bossy and even took $10 million from his account to a special project of hers. So we're on the, you know, and I've been, you know, the previous sessions we've been watching this devolve. And so we're during this session and he's like, you know, the last thing she did, like this was it and I can't believe it. And he's really activated and understandably so. And then he's saying, you know, she's just like, it's getting to the point where at the, I only schedule her at the end of the day so I can go home and have a drink because otherwise my partner can't even tolerate me. And so then, then he says, and then she's all controlling and then she switches and she gets super nice and she starts confiding in me like secrets and things I shouldn't know. What am I thinking at this point? Remember my background as a clinical psychologist? I'm thinking, oh, she might be a sociopath. I mean, can you believe this manipulative? Behavior? Okay, notice I have caught his energy. I am now leaning in and I'm about to lean in more than him. I then catch it and go, okay, I need to lean back. So first I need to lean back because I've caught his energy. And then I need to help him lean back to say, hey, so listen, Max, What's the bigger story here? What do you think the context is that, you know, you're getting this kind of behavior from her? And then he can talk about how there's an activist on the board. She's getting cremated from many directions. The investors are after her. She's under huge stress. And he's like, oh, maybe what's happening is because of that. And he starts settling down when he can lean back and start looking at the context and the data. Now, you don't always do these in order. And so this one, I went with don't lean first. And I had a really scary question. I was really afraid that A, it would make him mad at me. B, I'd make him feel bad, which was the following. Um, so I said, well, listen, Max, um, I appreciate she's micromanaging and all this, but you know, you always get your own way in the end anyway. And you know, you got your $10 million back. Why is this even bothering you? Like why get triggered at all? And that was sort of a novel thought for him. And, and again, it helped like make space, context, make space. Why is this even bothering me making a little more space? But I, tell, I could tell he hadn't like really settled in yet. And so then I went, wait a minute, let's think about this some more. She used to be your best friend. What would it be like if the, um, the goal in your next hour, okay, so we're going back to dimensions of leadership, et cetera, here. What if your goal in the next hour with her was to make her feel better at the end of the hour? Well, he loved that because it like brought all back to him, like, right, we used to be friends. We cared about each other. Um, so basically, you know, for us as coaches, notice what you're doing because you need, as coaches, we need to have these four paths available to us all the time. And at the very least, even if you can't do them, to think, um, okay, if at that path one, this is what it would look like. If you have two, this is what it would look like, three and four. And also for our leaders, I think it's very important to remember, we don't know. I mean, when have I run a global organization worth billions of dollars in media? That would be hmm, never. So we, we there can be active about know each of these pathways, be able to do them, and then be able to make your own choice. So before we go to um, questions on this, David, do you wanna make any last comments? Yeah, just what Carol's talking about is really powerful for coaches and just a quick application to a client that we had. So one CFO um, yeah. was working with a new divisional CEO and that new CEO had um, really missed their targets for the last quarter and that caused the whole public company to miss its earnings guidance. So the CFO called for a meeting with the CEO to come into the office 
And as we were preparing for that, the CFO's reflex was to um, be contemptuous, to feel betrayed. He was going to ask uh, a million questions for the divisional CEO about how, why did you do this? Why didn't you do this? How did this happen? How did this never happen again? And so he realized that that was his reflex. And then um, he just didn't lean for a moment. And then he thought, okay, this person is probably as upset as I am about this. So maybe I can have a different perspective when I go in. So the CEO walked in, divisional CEO walked in to the meeting, fully expecting to have a conflict. And the CFO said, uh, you look really tired. This must be really hard for you and your team. How are you coping? And that was a game changer. And that the shift in stance is another example of one of those very small movements that you can make in your leadership that create disproportionately positive outcomes. So now the divisional CEO was much more inclined to engage in a real dialogue and get to the truth of the matter and remedy things for future quarters. And the reason that David's question worked, because maybe you could go, well, that sounds kind of magical. Uh, he just asked a question and the CEO transformed. Au contraire. That's again, one of these tips of the icebergs that we've done a lot of our work based on Richard Boyatzis and intentional change theory. So this coach had had a lot of experience with David saying things like, hey, if you were a 10 out of 10 on how you handled this, what would that look like? Who do you really want to be in this situation? So it's sort of builds on that so that these things can sort of get into your system and you need to practice a lot of reps so that you can do this under normal conditions, then you can do it under high stakes conditions. So why don't we pause now for some questions and reflections and, um, and a plug, which is again, as I was saying, these are like teeny weeny snippets with icebergs underneath. So if you are feeling so inclined, please, today's our launch day, actually buy a book. And if you like it, review it, because I hope you care about us a little bit and would like us to be Wall Street Journal bestsellers, which means um, anything that is sold or reviewed after Saturday doesn't help that. So feel free to um, be invited and not pressured. Um, and also have more questions on on. Um, more questions on this that we can and answer to you later. So, okay, Jeff? We all have our credit cards in action. Okay, and, uh, yes, yes. We'll give you our firstborn good... children or dogs <laughs> or cats. We have in your lots case, of Jeff. great questions. So let's get to a couple of them. And I okay. will remind everyone that, uh, as Carol said, we will save these questions so that um, Carol and David can get to those that we didn't get to, but there's a couple of really good ones. So Jeffrey Cohn is asking a question I love, which is when you have a leader in crisis, how do you first talk them off the cliff so they can be present mm -hmm. to this approach? Calm down now. No. <laughs> <laughs> and he s slaps you. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, it called leaning know. in. Yeah, but in but in the coaching through the years, it can't be the first time the person has been done that. So a lot of times with people, when they start revving up, again, use their language, you often say, okay, downshift. But it may also be, hey, let's remember when you've done this well in the past. This feels really intense right now, but you probably have the capacity to manage this. Um, David, over to you. Yeah, I think if you're experienced with the model and framework and you've been working with us, then I think you would just scan that model and ask where is it that you need to focus. So you don't have to go through the whole model um, in that sequence. Mm -hmm. It's like what might resonate with you most. So for example, if your thinking is not really clear about what your goals are, who you need to be, or how you need to relate in that moment, you might want to just focus on that uh, after you settle the course. Um, if you're stuck and you don't have different ways to win, maybe you want to focus on that. Or maybe it's about how do I really articulate this effectively to my team and bring them along so that we're all aligned. So I think you just go into the into the subset of the model that you have. If you don't have that experience, then I think we would kind of run through that with you <laughs> and unpack that together and figure out which parts of the model are most important right now. Again, after, mm -hmm. um, after we mm -hmm. help you settle. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. great. I mean, I think and you can't get much more powerful than sharing with someone a question of how do you want to be in this moment? 
especially when they are completely stressed because they usually also, will step them and back. And give them permission to be upset, to say, hey, listen, just this, this state will pass. Just, you know, right. be here now for a little bit. That's great. So I love this question from Ched. I've never heard this question before, so I'd love to hear how you would respond to it, which is that the platinum rule <laughs> says treat people how you want, how they want to be treated. Yeah. But how do you avoid becoming a people pleaser? Oh, I like that. Isn't I've that never heard that one Thank either you, Ched. before. <laughs> um, because you're doing it for them. People pleasing is when you're doing it for you. So that's even sinking below the golden rule. It's like, I'm treating this person so that they're going to be nice to me. That isn't even the golden rule. That's a little bit lower, but a very good, um, again, nobody's ever raised that before. So I really like that. That the, How would you, as, an, as a coach, how would you yeah. look to identify that if it were potentially, because there are people pleasers that we yeah. work with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I just, I think I might go with what's, what's your actual goal? I mean, it's actually an ego driven moment. It's like, I'm more concerned with me than the other person. So this might be, Hey, let's work on the second or the third dimension of leadership here in this situation. Who do you want to be? Do you want to be someone who is just kind of appeasing this other person? And by the way, might that be strategic now? <laughs> because sometimes, you know, People pleasing is, a, is your own default you have to work on. And sometimes it's strategic, like this person's right. going to blow. I better just help calm them down. But um, I think I'd ask the person to check in with themselves and just say, hey, listen, what's driving this? David, what's your thought? Yeah, I think when we talk about relating to people the way they want and need to be related, I think need has multiple meanings. Mm. So um, need is in terms of how can I receive this feedback, but my need as a leader, giving that feedback, maybe to hold someone accountable. So I think it might be a very tough message, but I just need to unlock the way that they can receive that message. So that's how I would answer that. Beautifully said. <laughs> Great note to end on. I thought that was just a cool question because I hadn't seen that before. It was. It so was great. This was so wonderful. We could obviously keep going for another hour easily. We have lots of great questions that I apologize we weren't able to get to, but we will keep them and we will share them with David and Carol. But I just want to take this moment to thank the two of you. I have missed Carol for about a year because she has been <laughs> disappeared with <laughs> David writing this. Two book, years. So two years. years. Yeah. So we are and so excited. Help out these little books. Give them a home. Make give them happy. Give them a home. <laughs> give them to your clients. Give them to your colleagues. And um, we will have you back. You know, you can't get far from the Institute of Coaching since you, no. <laughs> you helped, you were founder of it. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all. And I wa just want to wish the two of you the best with this. It is uh, super you. exciting. And it's Thanks so much, for, Jeff. And if, you can put, and if you can put your questions in the LinkedIn live or the LinkedIn um, section of the Institute or find us, we will, we will answer them because it'd be helpful for us to know what the questions are. We will yep. share them with you. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for taking Thanks, the time. Everyone. Go out and buy real-time leadership and we will <laughs> see you again very soon. Take care. Bye. Thank Bye. you guys. Bye. Thanks a lot.